Welcome back. We're at chapter three in our read aloud called Journey Outside by Mary Q. Steele. He woke up and there is a sunrise and he's never seen the sun before. He's lived in a cave for all of his life. And we're going to find out what he discovers. Chapter three. He lay there without moving. Once he had had a dream in which he had had beheld the blaze of many thousand torches so that the flickering shadows and darkness had disappeared. But in the dream, he had seen only the narrow walls and the low ceilings of the tunnel. No dream had ever told him that there was this infinite, enormous, light-filled nothingness near enough to touch yet so far away, a lifetime's travel would bring you no closer to its end. The light grew brighter and Diller turned his head to find its source, a huge red ball hanging in the clouds just over the edge of the world. It hurt his eyes to look at it and he turned his head in the other direction. He was lying in the middle of a great expanse of something which he could not have named rather like the water weeds that floated in the river. Only these things were fastened to the sand and mud beneath them and they were of a color Diller had only glimpsed on the sides of certain fishes shining in the glow of the torches, or when the eyes of the long-legged spiders reflected the flames as the big spinners hung from the rocks as they did once in a great while. The color was green. Diller knew it suddenly. This was what grandfather's grandfather had meant. This lively color, soft yet brilliant, spreading out underfoot, and crawling up onto all the strange-looking things scattered around here and there. And there, far over there, those tall things, gray and smooth and round, their top parts were laden with this green, their heads swathed in it, and their outstretched arms carrying huge burdens of it. Were these things alive? They moved gently. Diller scrambled to his feet and made his way slowly toward them. He heard no sound. Only the air stirred softly as he had known it to do when the tunnel branched or a big cave gaped in the wall. Watching the tall objects ahead of him, he decided it was the wind that made them move. They were not alive after all. When he came close, he was not so sure. Something about them was alive. Putting his hand on those warm gray bodies, he was certain that they were living, but they would not they would not be things to fear. He knew that. The green stuff grew out of them in little flat flakes with tiny handles. The flakes were smooth and cool to the touch. Were they like fish scales, only larger and softer? Diller wondered. Wondered. No, the rough surface of these, those bodies must be like fish scales, he told himself, and tried to prove it by breaking off a piece. The stuff underneath was familiar to him, and suddenly he knew what these creatures were. They were logs, round and straight and made of wood. Somehow, sometime, somewhere, grandfather's grandfather's father and all the rest must have knocked these things down and stripped them of their outer cover and fastened them together to make rafts. And surely then this was the very spot they had left for a better place. But how could anyone want a better place than this? As he walked under the trees, Diller marveled. Light and space were enough to make this the most beautiful and amazing place that anyone could dream of. Beyond the grove of trees, the land sloped steeply downward. Diller was a little scared. It seemed a strange thing for the world to do, tipped on its side so everything must slide to a heap at the bottom. Nothing seemed to be sliding. A line of low trees crept down the hill and Diller made up his mind that he would go beside them to catch hold of them if he started falling. He cried out abruptly. Something was coming toward him in the air. A little fish gliding through the air, helping itself along with great fins that stuck out from its sides and then folded them tight against them. A wonder, a wonder. The fish stopped suddenly in the top of one of the little trees, put out little legs to hold itself up threw back its head and opened its mouth, made such sounds as Diller had never heard before. No water murmured so joyously or so sweetly or so triumphantly. Nothing, nothing had ever rung upon his ears like that or made his heart feel it must burst open with the song's wild delight. Even when it had ceased, it echoed in his head. 
the fish flew up and out of sight and Diller put his hand to his head. He was dizzy with the marvels. Who would have guessed? Who would have dreamed? The sun shone upon him as he faltered down the hillside. The clouds were almost gone. The warmth fell pleasantly upon his skin. The grass smelled delicious. Several big white things that he had supposed were big stones lying about in the fields had got up on small legs and began to move around. Diller stopped. Two of them came close and looked at him with gentle, rather stupid faces and then began to nuzzle at the green grass. He wondered if all this lovely world belonged to these fluffy creatures, if they were the only inhabitants except the green bearing logs. Was Diller the only man in all this beautiful land? Hey, he said to one of the white things, and it answered, Bah! and trotted quickly away. Diller stared after it, feeling a little forlorn. A light was growing brighter and brighter. It hurt his eyes fiercely, and he kept within the shade of the little trees as much as he was able. Something under the trees smelled wonderful, made his mouth water, though it was like nothing he had ever tasted. The smell seemed to come not from the greenery or from the bodies of the trees, but from the small roundish pink and yellow objects which hung from them and sometimes fell softly to the ground. Diller picked one up and examined it. The skin seemed to be the skin seemed to his fingers to have tiny hairs all over it, but the object itself was soft and rather squashy. He squeezed gently and the skin split and juice spurt out over his hand. At first he was horrified for he supposed that this thing was living. But after a bit, he concluded that since it had fallen from the branch, it was probably dead. He started to wipe the juice from his hand, but it smelled so delicious he stopped. He was hungry. He had had nothing to eat since his fish stew supper, and much had happened since then. He looked carefully at the fruit. Would it harm him to eat it? He touched his tongue tentatively to the juice. He laughed aloud in delight. He had not imagined there was such a taste. Suddenly he felt that he had spent all his life aching for the flavor of whatever this was. He bit into the peach and ate it all in seconds, not even being slowed down by the big rough seed on which his teeth had closed jarringly at the second bite. Better to die eating something so deliciously poisoned than to die of starvation, he told himself, for he had no idea what in this strange country might be wholesome and what might not. He picked up a dozen of these objects from the grass and ate them all. Afterwards, his stomach felt a little odd. Perhaps these things had indeed poisoned him. He waited to die, but though he suffered some sharp pains, he did not seem to be dying. He sat down in the deepest shade he could find, for he found the bright light too warm on his skin and agonizing to his eyes, and wondered whether his father and grandfather would ever know what had happened to him. One of the singing fishes lit above him and murmured sweetly, a pleasant soft warble, almost like the sound of running water, and by and by Diller fell asleep. When he woke, he concluded that he had in truth been poisoned and was dying. He was on fire all over. His eyes were so swollen, he could barely squint through the lids. In his mouth, his tongue was thick and swollen with thirst and venom. He touched his face, finding it too puffy and feverish. And wherever his fingers brushed his flesh, flames seemed to follow them and sear the skin. He staggered to his feet and began to stumble around, half out of his mind with fear and pain. Oh, why had he thought to leave the raft where he was safe and, safe and comfortable? Oh, who would help him in this alien place, this country of fantasy? Not the white woolly things he had seen earlier, he was certain. They were too stupid to help. But when he glimpsed three or four of them through his watering eyes, he could not stop himself. He went toward them, half falling, reeling, and making eerie gargling noises between his cracked lips. The sheep grazed peacefully, only moving a little farther from him and a little farther and a little farther each time he came near. He stood still at last, hopeless, exhausted, frightened, and angry. He heard voices then, voices such as the raft people had, not the foolish flat voices of the white four-legged beasts. He could even... Make out a word or two, it seemed to him. 
he turned in the direction, waving his arms and uttering hoarse, gasping cries that sounded strange even to his own ears. He could see men. He was sure those blurred figures were men, and he wailed piteously. Ooh, 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 ooh. The voices ceased. Then suddenly they began again shouts louder than his own, shouts of fear and anger. Something struck him sharply on the shoulder, and then something else crashed into his forehead. And then he realized that the men were throwing stones at him. He stood still weeping holding his arms over his head to protect himself, begging for help while the shower of rocks stopped and there was the sound of running and then silence and he knew he was alone again. Come back, he pleaded. Come back, help me, help me. But no one answered and he sank to the ground, stunned and faint and sat there for a long time moaning and sobbing without knowing he was doing it thinking once when he heard the sounds that there must be someone close by, tortured and suffering as he was. Someone touched him gently on his shoulder, and the fire that of that touch jerked him back to awareness. He looked up and could make out a face looking down into his. My name is Dorna, said the girl's voice. Do not move. I will fetch my mother, and she will help you. And that is the end of chapter three would be on to chapter four so he's been found by people on the upper world once again journey outside what were the white-legged beasts in the field of grass He was on fire all over. His eyes were so swollen he could barely squint through his, the lids. And he found his face to be puffy and feverish. What has happened to Diller that he has never experienced since he has been inside the earth living in tunnels? 